Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Oracle coming in for another edition of my vlog. I hope everyone's had a blessed weekend and I hope that you are having a wonderful, wonderful blessed day. Today I'm going to talk about something that may be uncomfortable for some to hear. So I am putting a disclaimer before I get into it that this subject matter may be triggering to some people. My topic today is confessions of abuse from an ex-JW. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. If you follow my videos or listen to my videos, you know that I have talked on and off about some of the things that have happened to me, but I have never dedicated a video to it. And I think that as things are happening in the current events in the United States and across the, the world where people are coming forward with things that have happened to them in terms of physical and sexual abuse, especially as a child, and even as an adult in the Jehovah Witness religion, I wanted to use my personal experiences growing up as an ex-Jehovah Witness. And I wanted to talk about my, my life, my story. And if you're curious why I don't show my face, please feel free to go to my very first video when I do an introduction on why my videos are the way that they are. I never did or never do videos because of clicks. Um, I never do anything because I'm trying to get a whole bunch of views. I'm reaching out to people sincerely because I want to help anyone that's caught in the struggle, anyone that can come across my video and hear something that resonates with them, I feel like my job is done. Growing up as, an, as a Jehovah Witness, I am a third generation Jehovah Witness, I was. My parents were born into this cult. My grandparents were converted when they were very young. Um, they were married and my grandfather had went off into the military, was fighting in World War II. And um, my grandmother had started studying and I believe when my grandfather came back that they decided to get baptized. But my grandparents have been Jehovah Witnesses for most of their life. Um, and both my grandparents on both sides are deceased. Um, both of my grandparents were Jehovah Witnesses. Um, and interestingly enough, my grandparents were best friends. So my paternal grandparents and my maternal grandparents were best friends. And that's how my mother and father met. My mother and father have literally known each other since they were born and in, and there is a cute picture um, that one of my grandparents had of my mom and dad literally in the crib together. So I'm one of those people that I know people that have known my family for generations and have known people in my family for generations. I'm also African American. Um, I am someone that comes from African descent, United States, and I'm, I'm bringing all this up because one of the things that I've come to realize as I've been doing these videos and sharing information and also going back and doing my own research, um, that these specific things that I'm talking about collide. I can no more tell my story about being a Jehovah Witness than I can talk about being an African American in the United States. They collide. So when I talk about abuse 
from my family and I talk about the sanctioning of abuse and I talk about the things that happen in my family, it is going to have something to do with the ethnic group that I come from, the community that I was raised in, and the religion that my family was a part of. They all collide. So, you know, again, I'm someone who's highly educated. I've gone to graduate school. I've, I've published things. And, um, but that's all theoretical stuff. I, I've lived, I've lived, I've lived. And I'm glad that I did pursue my education. I'm glad that I did travel all over the world. I'm glad that I know people from all different walks of life. Um, but I feel very strongly about my advocacy for ex Jehovah Witnesses, especially those that have been abused and those from groups that I feel have been marginalized and silenced in society. So I am a female, I am a woman, I am someone who grew up in the Jehovah Witness organization as a African American female in the United States. My family came from the South, I lived in the Northeast. Whenever I think about talking about my story of abuse, and again, one more disclaimer before I get into it, um, some of the things I may talk about, I'm a pretty straightforward person. I try not to pull punches. So there will be some, I'm going to try and not be as graphic, but I will be talking about some things that may be triggering to people. So if in any time that I talk about something that causes you to feel emotional distress, feel free to turn it off or feel, feel free to share with people so that it doesn't take you into an immerse, emotional turmoil within yourself. These videos that I do are for healing purposes only. It's for you to know that you're not alone. I made peace with what happened to me a long time ago, but I think that it's important to sometimes talk about it. I don't think that there's ever a time when you fully are perfect. Um, and, and that's okay. As long as you've resolved the bulk of your pain and you've made peace with it and you figured out how to go on and be happy because that's the most important part of it all. Whenever I start thinking about the abuse that I specifically suffered at the hands of the men in my family, I think about the quote from The Color Purple when uh, Seely says, a girl child isn't safe in a house full of men. It's true. I am the only girl of my parents. I grew up with one brother that had the same mother and father as myself. I grew up with two brothers that had the same mother and a different father. And I grew up with uh, a woman that had a son when she married my father. She had two sons when she married my father. Six months after my father married my stepmother, one of her sons was killed. So I literally grew up with one person that is my father's stepson. I do not consider him to be family for a lot of reasons, but it is what it is. He is technically my father's stepson. I want to go back. I want to talk about the first thing that happened to me. Um, all of the people I'm talking about were Jehovah Witnesses. But one of the things that I want to say is that in the African American community, we do have a problem with not protecting females and girls like we should. In the African American community, we do have this idea that heavy handed discipline is, is okay. And I know that because this is my community and I grew up in it. When we see children acting out in a department store or a supermarket 
and we don't see that parent taking a stick to their behind or or, or spanking on him, spanking on him or her, we're like, they're not being raised right. That doesn't happen in our community. We will tear their butt up. So I know that because <laughs> this is this is this is home for me. And we we believe in heavy handed spanking old school. That's what you hear. I grew up with everything is old school. Children are seen and not heard. This is what I grew up with. So the mentality of being spanked was as much a part of my life with my extended family that were deeply African-American and deeply Southern. Spanking was just as much a part of my culture as Sunday dinner with grandmom and grandpa, with collard greens and fried chicken and macaroni and cheese and black eyed peas and all that good stuff. Spanking was a part of it. But in the Jehovah Witness religion, spanking was also sanctioned and even endorsed. And it didn't matter if you were African American, if you were Hispanic, if you're a white American, I saw it because I've actually been to lots of different congregations and I've been around different congregations that had different racial makeups. The one thing that I saw in common was that corporal punishment was endorsed. I have never in the whole entire time that I've been associated with the Jehovah Witness organization, have I ever heard of some parent being disciplined or even counseled for disciplining their child or, or, or spanking their child too harshly or, or smacking them or punching them. I've, I've seen all of these things in congregations and I have never ever heard of anyone getting in trouble for it. So I, I wanna talk about my own personal experiences because it's good that we're talking about sexual abuse and it's good that we're talking about pedophilia in the Jehovah Witness organization. But I think it's just as important for us to talk about the violence, the violence against women and, and, and females and, and males and children. And I wanted to talk about my own personal experience because in everything that I'm going to tell you that has happened to me growing up as a Jehovah Witness, and there are going to be some instances of sexual misconduct that have happened to me. Not one of the things that happened to me ever was anyone ever punished, counseled, or anyone ever filed a police report. Let me say that again, and everything that I'm going to tell you, nothing was ever done to the parent or the grandparent that did these things to me. And I don't think that my specific situation and the things that's happened to me is, it, is something that is so distinctive or that this doesn't happen. No, I know for a fact that my personal experiences is pretty typical of someone like me. So I'm the Oracle and the first abuse situation that I wanna talk about is the one that happened to me when I was about four years old. Four years old is an important time period for me because there were a few abusive things that happened. I'm not sure what motivates parents or, or abusers to reach out and do things to children at certain ages, but I, I can hypothesize because I do have degrees in psychology. I, I wanted to be a child psychologist when I first started studying psychology. I went in a whole different direction, but I do have an undergrad in it. I think that the mentality of some people is that they want to do things at an age when they don't think that children are 
completely cognitively aware that they're going to be able to actually really tell other people or that people are actually going to believe them. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is what happened to me when I was about four years old. And what had happened is that my father, my father has been disfellowshipped four times and my father is actually now an elder in Georgia, in the Georgia, Georgia congregation. And one of the things that I think is really interesting, my father is actually married to the woman that, that he cheated on my mother with. Um, she committed fraud when my father was in the military and pretended to be my mom and had her two children pretending to be my brother and I so she could get military benefits and send her children to uh, military school while my mother was struggling to pay bills and had to borrow money from my grandparents um, to help make sure that we have food to eat. So, um, so people that see my father and they know that he's been married to this woman for over 30 some odd years, they'll never know that my father is this abusive person who's, who's beaten his wives so he beat my he beat my my stepmother who was my father's mistress even before her, he married her he beat my mother and he beat me and he beat my brother. One of the worst things that ever happened with my father is that my mother started to stand up to my father. So my father he had been disfellowshipped at the time, and he was not coming home every night. There would be times when my father would just stay over his mistress' house. And we lived in a city where everybody knew everybody. And my mother was starting to hear that that certain people would see my father out with this woman. And my father, my mother is only like five, two. Um, she's transitioned along with, well, along with my brother. But my father is 6'5". And, you know, so really a bullying situation where there was such a, a huge difference in height. And my mother was petite, you know, small woman. My father's this tall, muscular man. And he was bullying. He was a bully. My father is a bully. And out of all the things that my father's done, I don't think that there's anything that can ever cover the abuse. So I think that's what has really affected everyone more than anything that that I can think of. Yes, him cheating on my mother. Yes, him, you know, going away to the military and having his mistress on base, pretending to be my mother and her children, pretending to be my brother and I so they could get military benefits was devastating to my mother. My mother actually had a breakdown over it. But the lasting effects of abuse have stayed with with us. And I no longer have contact with my father simply because of his abusiveness. I've tried to forgive him for a lot of things that he's done. He's definitely written me emails. And I mean, if you're any in any way, shape or form familiar with the mentality of Jehovah Witnesses, you will you know that there's a lot of things that are sanctioned there's a a whole lot of things about forgive someone you know not nine ninety nine times continue to forgive them but forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that I actually need to or should have a relationship with you so the first and most traumatic thing that's ever happened to me one of the most traumatic beatings that I ever received was a fight that my mother and father had that they put me in when I was four years old. So my father had come home after not being home for about two days and my mother, this was the seventies. So there was a lot of change going on in society about women actually being more empowered and so my mother had been listening to the woman that lived next door to us 
that was actually going to college and I think she had actually, and she was a, a true feminist and she used to talk to my mother all the time about being an empowered woman and standing up for herself. Because I used to remember I was small and I used to sit on the step and listen to my mother talk to this woman. So when my father finally came home, she started standing up for herself and she started telling my father that he cannot continue to come in the house anytime he wants, you know, not come home. He was a married man with two children. So my father starts insulting her and tells, you know, tells him, tells my mother to leave him alone. And um, he starts, you know, you know, throwing her against the wall. And I remember I've been asleep. I'm laying in my bed. I had, I had a room full of, you know, toys and bears. I used to love to talk to my bears. And I, you know, I had a princess room. Don't get me wrong. My, my room was painted pink and I had a brass bed. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I was, you know, the doted on little girl. I was the only girl and I was the baby. But everything changed. So my mother and father are fighting. And my mother stands up to my father when he throws her against the wall and pushes her head into the wall. My mother picks something up and she throws it at my father and it hits him. And my father snaps and he grabs her by her neck and he's like, I'm going to kill you. And my mother was able to, you know, wrangle away from him and she hits him. You know, she's defending herself. And my father runs, she runs, and then she runs out of the room. And surprisingly enough, she runs into my bedroom. And I, everybody in that situation was surprised. My father freaked out when my mom ran into the room. I'm laying in the bed and I remember sitting up and holding my bear and they're literally, my father is grabbing my mother because she's on the bed. And he's like, what are you doing? Get out of my, my child's room. Get out of, you know, get out of quote unquote Oracle's room. And my mother says, she's my child too. And he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So they're going back and forth. And my father loses his temper. And, you know, having known my father my whole life, when my father's about to, like, flip out, he gets a look in his face. And it's, it looks demonic. It looks like he is like he's it's like an exorcist. He loses control. And and I remember seeing that and it, it puts the fear, fear of God in you, I, I swear, because you can tell that he's not in his full right mind. And I remember seeing that. And I remember him grabbing my mother because he said he was telling my mother that he was going to kill her. And my mother picked me up and she grabbed me. And my father is like, what are you doing? Put my daughter down. And she's like, she's my daughter too. And, and she's holding me and she's putting me in front of her. And my father starts freaking out because... Um, again, my mother had a lot of emotional and mental issues, and I had to forgive her for this. I had to forgive both my parents for this that happened, and my father is trying to push me down, and he's trying to hit her at the same time because he's totally lost it. And he goes, and she's hitting him and using me to try and stop him from hitting her. And then my father finally freaks out and jumps up and he's he's gonna punch her dead in her face. And right as he does it, my mom throws me up and tries to use me to shield, shield the punch. She thought, and I had to get to this, that he wasn't, he was gonna stop himself from punching her, but she was using me as a shield. But what actually happened is my father punched me in the face. And, and that was so traumatic for me because um, I was, I was innocent. And I remember what happened after that. I remember that my mother dropped me on the bed and she starts screaming and hollering and she starts crying uncontrollably and runs down the steps. My father 
he acted like his hands caught on fire and he literally ran and dropped his hands and ran out of the room. And I remember that nobody consoled me. Like nobody held me, nobody like asked if I was okay. And I remember laying there shaking uncontrollably, like uncontrollably shaking. Like I was, like I was freezing cold and I finally, like, I don't know if my mom left. I don't know if she went around the corner. I don't know what happened. I know that my father ran into the room saying, she's crazy, she's crazy, and slammed the door. And I remember finally tiptoeing out of the bedroom. And I was a little, no, short little thing. I could barely see the mirror. So I used to do this thing where I would put my foot and I would, you know, kind of, put my foot on the toilet seat and then I was able to like get to the sink when I would like sit on the sink and look in the mirror and I remember I looked in the mirror my nose had a little bit of blood coming out of it and I remember how I felt and I remember using some toilet paper to wipe my nose I remember opening the door and I heard my dad as he cracked the door and he said, baby, are you okay? And I said, uh-huh. And I went back into my bedroom. That was the first time that I was abused by my parents. And I blamed both of my parents equally. My mother was a witness. No one ever, no one ever asked me about it. No one ever say anything about it. My mom and dad, for about two or three months, they, they treated me differently. It was almost like guilt, the way that they, they um, were around me. But my feelings towards my parents changed. My brother and I, we both love our parents, but my love changed. You know, I didn't have this deep, profound love for my parents after that incident. It changed me forever. Um, and I can honestly say I hated my parents. I didn't like either one of them. And I think they knew it because I, I really couldn't articulate it, but I knew that I felt that they didn't protect me. And, you know, they used to do things to me and dote on me and hug me and kiss me and all this kind of stuff hoping that I didn't remember, hoping that it didn't really affect the way that I felt about them, but it did. It actually did. So also when I was four years old, um, I repressed this memory for a long time, but I had been sitting on my grandfather's lap. Now, I don't know if my grandfather had been doing this before, but this is the one time that I remember. I was sitting on my grandfather's lap and he used to have me massaging his penis through his pants. And I didn't. I just wanted to make my grandfather happy. I didn't know that there was anything wrong with that. But this particular time that I was sitting on my grandfather's lap and he had me massaging his penis, my grandmother caught him and she said, what are you doing? What are you doing? I was I was not gonna say his name, but she called him, and I never forget. She pulled me. She 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 told him off, and she told me never sit on Grandpa's lap again. And then she my my grandparents were actually babysitting me, and she told me to not say anything. That you know don't want to worry my mother. That everything is fine. Grant, it's not gonna happen again. But see, growing up in the African-American community, in the Jehovah Witness community, I know that there are a lot of people that would say, well, that's not, he didn't really molest you. He he wasn't, you know, he didn't, he didn't rape you. He didn't, but see, that's the thing. See, my grandfather actually was a pedophile and my grandfather actually did rape my aunts and he did rape, you know, he did take advantage of young girls. 
he was trying to do something to me and he got caught. And let me tell you that what my grandfather did to me was make me sexualized way before my time and made me aware of men having penises and, and having me massage them way before I should have known about any of that. And it was very, very disturbing to me. And it, it actually did affect me. A girl child isn't safe in a house full of men. You know, African-American females are just not protected. Um, and I felt that way in my family. And I felt like even as a Jehovah Witness, I was not protected. Nothing ever happened to my grandfather. When I found out that my grandfather had been raping my aunts after he had passed away, I was horrified. I was devastated that my family had kept the secret from so many of the grandchildren in the family. You put my grandfather on a pedestal when he was a monster and nothing was done to protect us. How dare you? And this is my story. Growing up in the Jehovah Witness organization, my grandfather was a presiding overseer. He wasn't just an elder, he was a presiding overseer. My father, who's been disfellowshipped four times. I mean, literally, you know, I was telling my husband, you know, my husband's never been a Jehovah Witness, but he understands a lot of it more so for me explaining to him. But I'm like, I told him, I was like, most of my childhood and teenage years, my father was actually not a Jehovah Witness. I guess I would call him a Jehovah Witness sympathizer because he was he was not in the organization, but he followed the rules and, you know, he was in and out. But now this man who's been, I mean, like, it just, it really, really, I think more so than the sexual abuse cases, it actually causes people to see the the legitimacy of these elder positions. These are these are men. These are imperfect men. These are men that are married to their mistresses. They are, these are men that have beat their children, sexually molested their children, been pedophiles. Um, and done all kind of heinous things. And then they're out there supposedly leading the flock and making life decisions for for people who, who may have their own issues themselves. So those were the earliest times of me being abused. I'm not going to bring up every single spanking that I had, but I do want to mention that I was spanked every day in some form or fashion until I was six years old. My mother used to keep switches, old school, African-American. She used to keep switches and she used to keep them in some water. So anytime that I ever did anything and she couldn't control me, I would get, I would get my legs beat on. She would switch, 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 hit me with the switch. And that's really why I wanted to be a child psychologist because what happens is with someone like me, I was a precocious child. I was actually, when they actually did test me and they found out that there were some things about my abilities and my intelligence that made me act the way that I did, that I wasn't going to be the child that sat still and sat in a corner and didn't say anything. I was actually the child that was going to ask questions and that was going to be a little bit more, I don't, I hate to use the word difficult, but you're just going to have to put a little bit more energy into raising me. That doesn't make me a bad person. That doesn't make me, uh, you know, a, a bad child, but from the Jehovah Witness organization, from the way that the African-American community was, you sit there, you shut up, and if you don't, you get spanked. End of story. And that is the way that I was raised. But I'm not here to talk about every single time that I was received corporal punishment. I really want to talk about the times when I was abused. And, you know, there are some people that think that any type of spanking is abused. I honestly don't believe that. I think that there are legitimate times when you can 
can, you can use it. I don't think it should be used frequently. I think it should be used as a last resort. I think that um, most of the time, you know, issues that you have can can be resolved with taking away things, um, you know, with there's there's a lot of ways to get an objective. It really depends on the child and it really depends on the situation. Um, and I don't think that beating sh is appropriate after a certain age, after a certain age when you can take away things that they want. And again, I have two, I have two honorary children. Um, and so, and I've been with them for many years. So I know from what I speak, you know, and there, there's multiple ways that you can, you can discipline children. It's not just you spank them, you smack them across the face, you get a, you get a belt. So, one time, my father, now this is a few years later, my father and mother had gotten divorced and my father had visitation rights. He used to pick my brother and I up every weekend and we would spend the weekend with my father. He would pick us up. Saturday morning and we would spend the night and my father would bring us back home Sunday evening. This particular Saturday that my father had picked us up was a little bit later. Now again, I also I was a ballerina. I used to take dance lessons. I, you know, took dance lessons for for years, for years and years and years. So if you see my house, you'll see my little picture that I've been able to keep of me as a ballerina <laughs> and my youngest daughter it's also I was just sharing with her the other day that you know I've done more recitals and dance concerts than I care to talk about because um, she's right now I think she's doing um, the Nutcracker again so <laughs> anyway my father had picked this up a little bit later because I had some dance classes that I was taking and I think I was rehearsing. So for whatever reason, I had gotten in trouble again. You don't remember those things, but for whatever whatever happened, my father had taken me in the car, I remember my stepmother being there and he had told me, again, I'm at a point where you can uh, talk to me, can intellectualize. I'm gonna say I was about 10 years old and my father had told me that I needed to apologize for something that I had said to someone and I refused to do it. And my father got really upset and he said, no, you're going to do it. And I was like, I don't want to because I'm not sorry. <laughs> and my father got very upset. So normally when my father would come and pick my brother and I up, we would stop at my paternal grandparents many times just to say hello, they always wanted to see my brother and I before we went to my father and stepmother's house. And that was no exception. That particular day, we were actually stopping by my grandparents. So my father, I still remember him looking at me through the rear view mirror. And I remember him saying, okay, we're gonna see what happens when we get to grandma and grandpa's house. So we get to my grandparents' house and my father grabs my hand and he, I remember him yanking me up the steps and my grandmother's like, what's going on? And he's like, I got to talk to, I got to talk to quote unquote, the Oracle. I need to talk to her. I got to, I said, I got to set her straight. So I never forget us standing in my grandparents' bathroom. And he says, are you going to apologize or not? And I was like, no, I was very stubborn. So my father holds back and he hits me. He hits me very, very hard. And he looks at me and he says, I'm the father, you do what I say. And I said, I don't wanna do it. And my father yanks back and he hits me again. He hits me so hard that I almost fall on the floor. And by this time, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather is running down the hallway. And he's like, what is going on? And he's like, it's my child. I'm going to discipline her the way that I want. And he's like, he called my father his nickname. And I'm going to say it. my father's nickname was Bubby. And my grandfather says, Bubby, you're going to hurt that girl. Stop it. And he's like, no, this is my child. 
So he looks at me and he was like, now for the last time, are you going to apologize or not? And I said, I just shook my head at that point because I was in a lot of pain. And my father hauled off and he smacked me so hard that I blacked out for a second. And I, you know, I used to love cartoons. I used to love uh, Rogue Runner and I used to love Bugs Bunny. And I remember you would see, you know, when they would get hit, you see that little ring of stars in their head. And, and that's what I saw. Um, that's how I know I blacked out because I saw that ring of stars in my head. And my grandfather came into the bathroom and said, Bubby, that's enough. And my grandmother was right behind him. So my father was like, that's fine because you're not, whatever, whatever he, you know, decided to do, I wasn't going to go to the movies or something. But um, when you hit a child that hard, you have, you have crossed the line of, a, of discipline and is now abuse. And these are all things, again, I worked, I worked in social services for quite a few years before I transitioned to what I'm doing now as an executive in a completely different field, but um, people lost custody of their children for these type of things. So my father doing that, again, corporal punishment, and it is, you know, honestly, even if you look at the, you know, early Bill Cosby episode where they, you know, you hear him say, I bought you in this world, I'll take you out. I heard those type of things. You know, is this understanding that, you know, you're, you're my property. And if you don't act the way that I tell you to act, then this is what happens to you. Um, I used to get scriptures read to me. I used to get scriptures read about what they did to disobedient children, um, throw them to the lions. Um, you know, just, I, I remember quite, you know, just, you know, what, what the climate was like growing up as a Jehovah Witness and what was actually emphasized to me as, as a child growing up, I didn't have rights. I, I was not allowed to advocate for myself. I couldn't go to someone in the Kingdom Hall and say that my father is beating on me too much or I'm being abused, I'm being beat. That wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't what happened. But I want to go back so another thing that happened to me when I was when I was about nine years old, my 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 parents had gotten married and neither neither one of my parents, just as an aside, invited their children to their wedding. So let me also just say that not only did my parents not invite their children to their weddings, I didn't even know my stepmother. Like my father came and picked us up and said, we're now going to be spending the weekends with him. Because before my parents solidified their visitation, my father used to come and he used to pick us up on Saturday and we would spend Saturday with him. Then all of a sudden my mother and then my father told us that we would be spending weekends with them, that the child custody arrangement had been finalized. So the first time that this happens, right before my father puts the key into his quote unquote new apartment door, he turns around and says to my brother and I, oh, by the way, I got married yesterday and I'm here to introduce you to my new wife and her, her children. My father did that. That's that's the man that married. That's the man that married my stepmother. That's the man that fathered me. That is a selfish, just, I, I can't talk about how horrible that was, but this is what my parents did. My mother, at least we knew my stepfather. Um, she had met him in the Kingdom Hall because when my father married my my father's mistress, my mother was devastated. And the first man that gave her attention was who she, you know, and, and, you know, he's educated, 
Um, he was someone who had been uh, had been converted to being a Jehovah Witnesses well into adulthood. So, and he had he had a house in a nice area of the city we lived in. He was an educator. Um, he had land. So um, my mother thought this was a good thing. What she didn't know was that this man was mentally ill. Um, he had been a prisoner of war and, and had lots of issues because of that. So again, you know, this is just as an aside, before you get married, make sure you really know the person that you're marrying. Because, and my mother had her, her issues. But anyway, The first year that my mother married my stepfather, and I want to say I was about nine years old, my stepfather decides that I've done something wrong. I don't even know what it was. And he decides to spank me. Well, he spanked me so badly that I was trying to put my, my hand up to protect myself. And he proceeded to yank my arm so hard that he dislocated it. So he dislocated my arm and I had to be rushed to the emergency. And I never, I never forget this. I never forget all of my family was there. And the only person that really advocated for me was my aunt, um, a favorite aunt of mine who was horrified that my mother had married this man who she was allowing him to beat on, on my brother and I and that he had dislocated my arm. My mother was so upset about everything that had happened that when my aunt started yelling at her, she fell apart. And then everyone, um, and then everyone was, you know, sort of let's not let's not upset her. Let's not um, let's not let's not uh, you know. Let's not rock the boat here because we know that my mother was already emotional. So everyone, you know, my my grandparents were at the hospital. My uncle was at the hospital. Um, my father, they tried to they tried not to let my father know what had happened. And but I remember I was in I was at in the ER with them doing um, procedures to get my arm back in the socket and I had to wear a sling. But they tried to make sure that I didn't wear the sling when I went to my father's house. Again, nothing was ever done. No one ever, no, nothing happened in terms of going to the Kingdom Hall, my stepfather getting in trouble. No, nothing like that happened, nothing. So by the time I was 10 years old, there was clear, a clear message sent to me that I wasn't protected. I wasn't protected. I, if I talked out of line, if I did anything, that I would, I would get beat. And I would get beat brutally. I would get smacked. I would get my yanked. Um, and I was a skinny mini. I was a skinny little girl. Um, and that's, that's, what, that's what happened to me. I was abused. I was mistreated. I was violently abused. So moving forward, um, I don't, I, you know, I can't really say after I was about, I want to say like 14, I really didn't, I didn't really get too many spankings or things like that. Um, but when I was 16 years old, um, my father tried to kill me. So if you listen to any of my other videos, I uh, talk about how I, how I lived with my grandparents when I was 17 years old because I had quite literally divorced my parents. And some of the things that I'm talking about are the reasons that I divorced my parents. When I was 15, 16 years old, I basically separately confronted my parents and told them that they were not good parents and that I no longer wanted to live with them. And I got my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, 
to support that decision and allow me to live with them. So I was ahead of my time in that I wasn't afraid to advocate for myself. And I started doing that because again, being abused like I was, I realized that there was no one that was gonna advocate for me but myself. Now, I was also molested by my stepmother's father, but he wasn't a Jehovah Witness, so I'll just briefly mention it. Um, basically, what he did is my father, as I mentioned, used to pick me up and my brother up, and we would spend weekends with my father. So what happened is that at that particular time, my stepmother's parents were staying in the bedroom that was supposed to be mine at my father's new house that he had bought. And what had happened is that my father had this job where he had to work night work. So he would get off work in the early morning, pick my brother and I up, and then we we would be allowed to go back to sleep until we wanted to get up at like 10, 10 or 11, you know, o'clock because he knew that he was basically getting us up out of our sleep so that we could go and spend the weekend with him. So that particular Saturday, my father had picked us up at like six in the morning and then we had gone and um, my, my brother stayed in the room with my father's stepson and I was asleep on the couch. And so they had went somewhere. So uh, the only people that were left in the house, um, my father had taken my stepmother shopping. Um, my brother had went somewhere with my father's stepson and I was asleep on the couch. And again, it, you know, again, these are specific times. So I was about 10 or 11, but I'm gonna say about 10. And I was sleeping on the couch and the only people that were there was my stepmother's father and mother. And my stepmother's mother was would stay in the room most of the time. So my stepmother's father had come out of the room and there was nobody else in the house. His wife was in the bedroom with the door closed and he leaned over. I was, I was like half asleep and he leaned over and then he put his hand underneath of me and started rubbing on my chest and squeezing on my nipples or you know my little nipples i mean i was 10 and um i was horrified i was scared to death and he started moving his hand down to my vaginal area and that's when i rolled over but let me just tell you what it felt like. i was absolutely horrified i was scared to death I, you know, I remember being this little girl and like nothing like that had ever happened to me. Like he was just touching all over me. And as soon as he saw me moving, he jumped up. So there was a movie that came out called Something About Amelia. And it was a story about, it was a groundbreaking at the time because it was one of the first times that the the American public through television had talked about child sexual abuse or parents sexually abusing their children or um you know or grandparents or anything like that so it was it was groundbreaking so i actually watched that movie with my father and after the movie my father said and he looked at me and he said has anyone ever touched you has anyone ever touched you inappropriately and I, I really appreciate my father doing it. was, you know, again, my father's a Jekyll and Hyde. There's been some great things that he's done and he's been just as awful. But in that particular time, he asked me that question and I told him. And this was when I was 13 years old. I lived with my father for two years when I was 13 and when I was 14. So moving to when I was 16 years old, um, when I was 15, I had moved back to live with my, my um my mother, but again, I want to mention that I actually did tell my father what his his father-in-law had done, and he was horrified. Um, so for that and many other reasons, my brother and I, because I just, you know, I didn't feel that my stepmother really advocated for my brother and I. She really didn't want us there. My father's stepson treat, mistreated us, 
And my father just wasn't the father that we thought. He had had a, an affair with a woman in the Kingdom Hall while he was this fellowship. And she was still a witness. She was a pioneer. Hot mess, let me tell you. So finally, my brother and I just decided to move back with my mother. And then again, that's when we started to see more issues with my mom, more issues with my stepfather. And I was like, you know what? Neither one of these places are actually good for us. So my father at first did not want me to live with my grandparents. Um, someone in the Kingdom Hall, a family member was like, your daughter does not tell you where she wants to live. She is not grown. You tell her where she's gonna live. You know, y'all need to stand up to, quote unquote, the Oracle. She's, she thinks she can do whatever she wants. So my father listening to that said, you're not gonna be able to go live with your grandparents. The problem was, is that my stepmother's parents were actually living with my father at this time. So now I didn't wanna live with my father because I knew that he was a violent person. And I just didn't like being around him because he was a bully. But I also didn't want to live there because there was someone who had sexually molested me and I didn't want to be around them. And, you know, I thought that my father, because he got really upset and confronted them and, you know, like said a bunch of stuff to my stepmother and to his father-in-law. But, you know, at that point when I was 16, my father didn't seem to think that it was important. And so basically what he said was, He's old, you know, he's like 90, you know, what are you? I'm like, I don't care if he's 110. I don't want to be around someone that has molested me. And my father just didn't seem to care. He's like, you're my child, you're going to stay here. So because of that, me and my father, our relationship hit a rock bottom. And I had already been living with my grandparents that summer and he forced me back there. So we really um, were at odds. And it was a daily back and forth. So um, I also didn't really wanna deal with my father's stepson. And so one time we were in the car and my father confronts me about my interaction with, with them. And I was like, I'm 16 years old at the time. And I, you know, it's just like, I don't really want to interact with them. So by this time, my father had been reinstated. He was a Jehovah Witness. And he was like, well, you really need to, you know, he's like, he said something like, I know you, I know that, you know, you're just, you're just being stubborn. And I looked at my father and I said, no, you don't really know me. And my father said, what did you say? And I said, Dad, you don't really know me. I haven't, you know, there have been years that I haven't lived with you. Um, you know, you don't really know you, know me. And my father got very upset. He lost his temper. And he proceeded to look at me and say, okay, I'm a, you're getting a spanking for that. And I'm like, I'm 16 years old. You shouldn't be hitting me. And he was like, I'll hit you at any age. You're my child. And I was like, you should not hit me, Dad. We had a disagreement but you have, you shouldn't be hitting me. I'm 16 years old. And he was like, I can do what I want. So he took me to my stepmother's sister's house, which happened to be close by. And I remember him, I wouldn't get out the car. He dragged me out the car. He literally opened the door and grabbed me and dragged me out of the car. He knocked on the door and, you know, my son of the sister's like, hey, Bubby, what's going on? And he's like, I need to use your downstairs. So he literally goes downstairs. And I'm like, Dad, do not do this. There was nothing that happened that you need to spike me. And he's not listening to me. He takes off his belt and he proceeds to hit me from head to foot. And I freak out. I freak out. And I grab the belt. And me and my father are going at it. And I tell my father that I hate his guts. And I literally meant it at that moment because I was like, I can't believe you're, you're, you're physically hitting me like I'm a slave in a field. 
and um, over, over a disagreement. And he finally stopped and he was like, how dare you tell me you hate me? You're my child. I'm like, you're beating on me. You're abusing me. This is wrong. <clears throat> so I need to go back. I need to go back to when I was 12 years old. I was hit, I was hit by a car when I was 12, six days after my birthday. And I was in a coma, almost lost my life. I have a hairline fracture. And I'm here to attest to the, the power of technology, the power of, cause there's people that meet me and they're like, I have no idea that any of that happened to you, but it did. So I was still in recovery. Also, my face was crushed. So that's all I wanna say. But if many people that meet me, they're like, I, 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 it doesn't even look like any of that happened. When I say my face was crushed, my jaw was crushed. I have screws in my jaw right now. Um, so I'm telling you, this is my life story. So about six months after I was hit by a car, I'm in recovery. I'm still, it, it hasn't been a year. And I decide I had finally gone back to school because once I had gotten out of the coma and went into recovery, I literally, once I was able to, I had a tutor that used to come to the house. But the last semester of school, I was actually doing pretty well and they let me go into school um, just to see how I would do. More for socialization, because I actually still had the teacher, um, had the tutor. So I went into school and um, some girls wanted to go to, I, I forget what it's called, but let's just call it Woolworth or Kmart, the comparative to Kmart to look at some, you know, some nail polish and, you know, whatever girls do after school. So I was going to um, walk home after that. So I got on this, um, I saw my brother and I gave him a note and I said, here's the note, tell Tell my mom and my stepfather that I will be home by 5.30. I'm going to the Kmart with these girls. I literally didn't think anything of it. But before that had happened, I had had a situation. So I come home and... My mom and stepfather were acting very weird. They, were, they would go through my stuff. Um, again, now that both of them have been diagnosed with mental illness and I've talked with their, you know, mental health therapist, they, they actually had a practice that actually met with them and my two younger brothers. So I understand a lot more, but when I was 12, I had no idea what was going on. They were very paranoid. Um, a lot of it had to do with what was going on in the kingdom hall. So my mom had grabbed me when I was about 12 years old and was yelling at me for some reason. And as she was talking to me, I was trying to emphasize a point and had like, you know, sort of in a demonstrative way, used my arm to hit my side to try and, um, you know, get her to see that she was making stuff up. So what happened is when I did that, my mom made a statement like, what are you doing with your hand? And my stepfather, who was in the bedroom sleep, because he also worked nights at the post office, comes running out of the bedroom in his underwear. And he proceeds to beat me up. And when I say he proceeds to beat me up, I mean, he punched me in my face. He smacked me all over my face. He threw me on the table. He was, I mean, like he was beating me up. Like he was literally, like he was just, and I was, first of all, I wasn't fully healed. My face had been smashed. Um, I had screws in my jaw. Um, my head was still healing from everything that happened. And when I say screws, like, yes, my, my jaw was wired shut for quite a while for me to get, make sure that my jaws were aligned correctly. So for him to do this six months after all of this was horrible, but what's even more horrible is that my mom sit, sat there and watched him do it. So um, I tried to run for the door, but ever since that happened, and, and my, my father did confront, 
my stepfather. Everybody at this time was Jehovah Witnesses. Everybody. No one ever said anything in the Kingdom Hall about what my stepfather did. My mother never said anything. My my father confronted him, told him he was going to kill him if he ever put his hands on me again. But no one ever called the authorities. No one ever did anything in the Kingdom Hall. Nothing ever happened other than my father confronted him about don't touch my child. So when I was 16 years old, I just wanted to mention that before I got into the 16 year old one. So my father and I were not getting along. I did not want to live with my father because a man that had molested me was also living in the house. That was my stepmother's father. And my father and I had gotten into this big fight because he had beat me at my stepmother's sister's house. Again, my father and I relationship had reached a complete low because the violence that I had seen that he would do to my mother and stepmother, he was doing to me as well. So my father had bought me a necklace with a with a diamond in the middle, a, a somewhat, you know, from I think Zales. Yeah, Zales. Um, he had, you know, gotten a bonus at work or something and he decided to buy me this necklace, my first gold necklace. And I remember it had a diamond in the middle. But I didn't want to live with my father anymore. And I was really upset that he was forcing me to stay there. And him beating on me at my stepmother's sister's house was sort of the end <laughs> of it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk to him. I refused to interact with him. I wouldn't get out the car. Um, I was like, if you, you're forcing me to stay here. So literally from Monday through Friday, I would go to school. I would come home. I would go in my bedroom. I didn't want to eat with them. I did not eat with them. And then on Friday, after my last class was over, I would take a bus to my grandparents' house and I would come back on Sunday night. So I really was doing everything I could to just stay away from my father and his household. And I was like silently protesting my father was very angry about it so we had a confrontation and i just was tired of being bullied and um, my stepmother's parents were no longer at that house they had moved out but my father and i really got into it he grabbed me <clears throat> he grabbed me and he was like, you're going to you're you're going to stop all this. I'm going to stop you from going to your grandparents. You know, you're you're still underage. I can tell you what to do. And I was like, I don't want to live here. Yeah, you told me I could live with my grandparents and you changed it. I hate living here. I don't like any of this. This is wrong. And my father and I started getting into it and I took the necklace that he had bought me and I ripped it into a thousand pieces and threw it on the floor. And my father lost it. He grabbed me and he he proceeded to choke me. He, he slammed me up against the wall and he grabbed my neck and he proceeded to try to strangle me to death. And I, it was the first time I actually thought that my father would, would actually kill me. But he started strangling me and I almost blacked out. I was trying to um, you know, kick and scream and, you know, wrinkle my hands. And I couldn't because my father was much stronger than me. And finally, I, I was able to say, I can't breathe. And then my father stopped himself and threw me on the bed. And he ran out of the room and I started screaming, screaming, screaming. I want my grandparents. I want my mother. I want my grandmother. And he finally let me go and live with my my grandparents. All Jehovah Witnesses, nothing was ever done. And let me just tell you how severe the the the, the neck injury was. If I when I looked at my neck, I had the print of where my father had grabbed my neck, trying to strangle me to death. This is the abuse that I that I suffered. And going back to when my stepfather beat me up. He busted my lip. He bloodied my eye. Um, everyone tried to cover it. Nothing ever happened. Nothing ever happened in the Jehovah Witness organization. 
And the last two things that happened to me was when I moved back with my father when I was an adult. And I had went back because my father had invited me to live with him to get back in school. Um, by this time, I was no longer a witness. I had left the organization when I was 17 years old. And I didn't realize how much shunning would affect me. My father had gotten disfellowshipped again. So he invited me to live with him and to go to school so that I wouldn't... When you are completely shunned by your family, it really, really affects you. And at first I thought I had this whole network outside of um, my family and, you know, that I was going to, you know, just move forward. But it wasn't a seamless transfer. I mean, now it is. Now I'm, I'm you know, I'm Teflon. But, you know, I never want to tell my story like I didn't struggle, like the shunning from all of my family didn't affect me, that I didn't, you know, try and move back and have them around me while I went to college. So I stayed with my father and I went to college and we got into a big fight. And my father did something um, that forever changed our, our relationship. Um, I didn't talk to my father for seven years. So, you know, my father was physically abusive to me. I, but you know, I was always in a way sort of was like, he's just angry. You know, he's just, he just overreacts when he gets upset. It was really difficult for me to put the abuse label on it for a long time until I was like, my father's an abusive person. And so I, I understand a lot, you know, when I would counsel women and, and young kids, it's, you want to explain away people's abusive behavior. Sometimes you even want to blame yourself. Like, you know, if I wouldn't have done this and that, this person wouldn't have strangled me against the wall or beat me up. You know, I provoked it. I just need to stop doing what I do. And I, I get it, you know, I get it. I get it so much because again, my father, and just like a lot of, of people that are abusive, they're not these outright, you know, evil people. There are really great things about them. And my father is a classic abusive person. Every time my father would abuse me, he would always, after the fact, feel so guilty. I could show you stacks of letters and emails that my father has sent me apologizing for his behavior, apologizing for the things that he's done wrong. And you, you're you hoping, you know, every time you're hoping that it's different. And the final thing that happened to me, you know, I was in college. I was, you know, really starting to come into my own. Um, I lived with my father for the last time and things had really just gotten really out of control between him and I. And my father used to have this thing where you need to pay your your part of the phone bill. You have to give him some money for living there, which was fine. It wasn't like I didn't do that. So let me just explain. I always worked. I always had a job. I always gave my father money when I lived with him. I always paid my portion of the phone bill. So at this time that I'm going to talk about the final straw in terms of abuse, I was going to school full time. I also worked 32 hours a week. I had a job and I was giving my father money. So I wasn't like I was laying in the house. I wasn't like I was doing drugs and I had, you know, people in and out the house. That wasn't the case at all. So I come home and by this time, my father and I had already been on the outs and I was really doing everything I could to find an apartment with my boyfriend. And what had happened is my father had gone through the phone bill and he used to circle or highlight the phone calls that I had made. So my father literally had left the phone bill, um, you know, had the phone bill, had went through it and he had come home from work and I was sitting talking on the phone in the front room. And so my father comes up to me and he's like, I have circled 
all of your phone phone calls i need and i've added it up and i put it on the front of the phone bill so i need you to go through make sure that i have very you know that i've circled everything correctly and then i need you to give me the money for the calls that you have made and i said okay so he looks at me and he's like i need you to take this phone bill in your hand and i was like why <laughs> i'm like i'm on the phone right now i think i was reading something while i was talking i was look, literally actively looking for an apartment at the time i was talking with my boyfriend and my father was like you need to take this phone bill in your hand and i was like can you just put it right here and um, i'll pay you and my father was like no you need to take and you need to put this phone bill and you need to take it in your hand Again, classic abusive situation. So I looked at my father and I was like, actually, I don't want to take the phone bill in my hand, and but I will pay you the money. And my father was like, put my phone down right now, right now. You do what I tell you to do. And I put my phone down and I said, dad, listen, every time you go off on a tangent and you become somebody else you always feel bad afterwards so listen before we even get there i will pay you the money i have a right to say whether i want to take this phone bill in my hand or not and i don't want to take it in my hand so we're going to have to move beyond that part of it because i'm i'm not going to take it in in my hand and my father was like you don't get to tell me that because you're in my house and I was like, look, dad, I don't want to go here with you. So we're, we're done. I have the phone bill. I'm going to pay it. Let's, let's move on. And my father lost it. I go upstairs. And at the time, I'm on my monthly. And I'm going to get a sanitary napkin because I actually know that I need to change it. So I go into the bathroom. <clears throat> And I'm like, I'm hoping that it's over because I'm like, I'm going to pay the phone bill. Let's leave it alone. So my father, what he had done, and I completely forgot about this. We, we had a bathroom upstairs and a bathroom that I went into, my father had actually probably about a month before that had changed the, there was a door that connected the master bedroom to the bathroom. And in that door, you could lock it on both sides. So when my brother and I had moved back in and was living with my father, there were a few times that we had forgotten to unlock the door. So when they were trying to get into the bathroom from their end, they couldn't get into the bathroom. So my father, about a month before then, decided that he was going to change the doors and that he was going to remove the ability for someone to lock the door from the inside of the bathroom and that the only people that could lock and unlock the door upstairs was through the master bedroom. But nothing, I had never had an, a situation happen where I ever felt like my father would ever violate me or walk into the bathroom on me. So I never even thought about it for a moment. <clears throat> so my father had ripped the phone bill from me and ran into the bedroom and said, you're going to take this, you're going to take this phone bill one way or another. So I'm in the bathroom. I'm on my monthly. I'm about to change my, my, my sanitary napkin. And I hear my stepmother say, Bubby, don't do this. And the next thing I know, my father has walked into the bathroom with my pants down, my vaginal area is showing, and my sanitary napkin that I was about to change is showing. And he shoves the phone bill in my hand. A Jehovah Witness, my father, he's an elder right now. I was... I, I don't think there's enough words to cover how I felt when my father did that, I was completely horrified. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed that he was my father. It was the first time that I actually was like, I'm actually ashamed to be related to this monster. But I, I, I was like, oh, okay. 
Well, now that you've done that, I'm going to show you what I think of this phone bill. I snapped. I absolutely snapped. And I went downstairs and I took the phone bill and I proceeded to put it on the uh, on the stove. And I turned and with gas heat, I turned it on and I burned the phone bill. And my father was right behind me because he's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do since you want to violate me. And then I'm like, I'm going to call the police because you have just violated me. You're getting arrested. And my father was like, what are you trying to do? Burn the house down? And I wasn't the, the, you know, it wasn't like that at all. I just, it was more of a, um, I, I don't know. I went into shock to be perfectly honest, but the, the phone bill burned. It never went anywhere else. And my father, like he flipped and he started hitting me, um, punching me. And my stepmother actually came downstairs and was trying to get my father to not hit me, which is one of the reasons why even with everything that she's done, I'm not going to really go too far and degrade her because my father threw her on the floor and I was like she did not have to do that she did not have to try and pull my father off of me but I actually did call the police and I actually did file charges of assault against my father for that and what happened is my father actually um was sitting at the police station they actually came to the to the house and my father and I were both interviewed sort of separately, but in the same vicinity. <clears throat> and my father started giving a statement and I heard him talking, but then he said something about my mother and I heard him degrading my mother and I lost it. And I started cursing at my father and I threw, um, I threw, they had some like fake thing on the, on the table at my father in front of the police. And they were like, ma'am, you can't do that. We're, we're right here. You can't just throw something at your father. So they were like, well, they looked at my father and he was like, well, she, you, you're, you're, you're right. You also have the right to file uh, assault charges against her. So basically what happened, I wasn't dropping my, my case. I, I had told my father that the next time that he ever hit me, that I was actually going to make sure that there was a police record of it. And I stood by my word. We went to court um, and uh, domestic court, I guess that's what they call it. And basically the judge was very upset that this had come before him. And he was more upset that it was a father and a daughter. And we both made our statements and he said, listen, you both, um, I suggest that you, that you drop this case. I don't think you want me to both fine you or punish you with anything. So I think it's in your best interest to drop this case, whether you interact with each other or not. I just hate to see a father and daughter fighting against each other. <clears throat> so my father and I just decided to drop the cases and they dropped the charges, but I, there is a court record of it. Um, and and that's really the last time that I have had any dealings with my father on any real basis in terms of, I never lived with him after that. Um, I did interact with him from time to time. And if you ever wanna hear like sort of the rest of that, I have a video called How Jehovah Witnesses Manipulate their non-believing family and ex-Jehovah Witness family members. And I, I kind of give the, the next part of that, but no more physical violence, no more sexual abuse or anything like that. But that's when I literally was done. And and thank you so much for listening to this. I know it, you know, I had to be a little bit graphic because I kind of wanted to talk about it. But I wanted to kind of share my story. I wanted to talk a little bit about the experiences that I had as a Jehovah Witness. And in none of these cases, nothing was ever done. You know, my I've been beat up. I've been taken to the emergency world, ward. I have been, you know, you know, molested or, you know, making, you know, putting my hands on uh, somebody's sexual parts 
as a kid, nothing was ever done. Nothing was ever done. So I want to go further with a, a girl child isn't safe in a house full of men. I, I want to put it at a girl child isn't safe in a house of Jehovah Witnesses. She's not protected. No one fights for her. No one advocates for her. They make you have two witnesses and they are so tyrannical. They make children go in and give testimony to unqualified, uneducated men. There's no women there to advocate for children. There's no parents that advocate for children. This is what I experienced in my life. No one fought for me. No one looked out for me. No one took my story seriously. I was blamed, victim blamed. She's a bad girl. She's disobedient. She's mean. I, I've had, you know, I, I've heard so many different things over the years and I'm like, have you walked in my shoes? Do you know my story? Do you understand what it's like when you've been beat from the time that you were a little girl because you were different? Because you didn't follow all the rules? I believe in justice for children. I believe in justice for every single child that is now an adult that has been mistreated, has been beaten, has been sexually abused by Jehovah Witness men and women who will not take responsibility for their actions. And that is why I share my story today. Thank you so much for tuning in to this very important vlog. I look forward to sharing with you soon. Have a blessed rest of your day. And remember, remember, the journey is the most important part of it.